Season five, episode eight. I remember my daughter saying, oh, that was such a cool time, Dad. I wish I would have been born during that time, like just to go cruising and, and experience all that. I think I said like, well, what if we got another lowrider? What if we did it again? What's stopping us? So we had just gone under quarantine and uh, they were like, yeah, that would be really cool. And I also thought, wow, this, is, this would be perfect. This would be a perfect thing to do with, with my girls and to just be part of that process of building a car and really the process of going out and driving the car. So we started uh, our search and I remember the whole COVID purchase process, bringing it back home. As soon as I drove home, um, the hydraulics were working and I told one of my daughters, grab, grab the camera, grab the phone, videotape this. And I just did a loop around our neighborhood. Both my girls have never experienced a car, like hydraulics in a car. So the first thing we did when I pulled up was hop, jumped in the car, started hitting the switches and, and videotaping my girl's first experience doing that. Then right after that, we wiped down the car, cleaned it up, and did the first thing that I could think of doing, which is what we used to do way back, is go to In-N-Out and go hang out in the parking lot. Went through the drive-thru, hitting switches, ordering our burgers and fries, parked right out front, because you couldn't sit inside, it was, it was COVID. So parked right out front, locked up the front, dropped the back, and sat there eating in and out like it was 25 years ago. It was, it was a great moment. And uh, I took a picture of that, just to, just to remember that. It's a 1972 Cutlass Supreme that started with the original engine. It still has the original engine, but we pulled it out, rebuilt. They had repainted it blue, but I wanted it to go back to original with a little bit of a flare. It came out perfect. If it was possible to order a juiced hydraulic lifted car from the factory, we wanted that effect. And I had promised the original owner when I had bought the car, he said, I need you to do me one favor. And I said, what's that? He said, you have to change the color of the car. I can't, I can't ever see that car driving around Vegas uh, and I don't want to see it the same color. I said, not a problem, it's perfect because we plan to rebuild the car anyway. Kind of went back and forth, you know, me with the girls and looking at different colors and swatches. And I think low riding for me is really a family affair. You know, I wanted to make sure that this process was included my family and included my girls. It was either going to be a gold or blue pearl and uh, went with the uh, blue ice. So it is a Jaguar, 90s Jaguar blue with uh, ice blue pearl on it. So the interior, as we were kind of figuring out the theme of what we wanted to do, we were tossing around white and we ended up coming out with a camel and tan interior with blue stitching, you know, brought the outside of the car in. We knew that once we went with blue and we went with the tan interior that we had to have some, uh, some gold and chrome, little, we got it through a little gold on the car, gold and chrome Zenith wire wheels. The other thing was as we built the car, there was something really important to me for the car to be built in Las Vegas and uh, built out in Las Vegas. Uh, it's a city where we, we live. We lived there for 13 years and I didn't want to do what I guess maybe the natural thing to do, which would be go to LA <laughs> and, build it, and build it out in LA. I wanted to make sure that it was a Vegas built vehicle. My first car was a Chevy Blazer, 88 Chevy Blazer. Somehow I came across a car club. It was all Blazers called Quiet Storm. I was 16 years old and I pulled over to talk to them and ask them questions about their, their Blazers. They're the ones who introduced me and got me into low riding, really. I was able to hang out with the, with the car club, but what really sort of just locked me in was being able to go to the meets and then starting to cruise. There was a level of brotherhood that um, I, I never experienced and didn't know until then. And it really, it, it just really solidified my, my love for low riding back then and, and car clubs.
After the Blazer, I had bought a Saturn. I always wanted to be different. Being Colombian in a mostly Mexican you know, city, I always felt a little different. So my last lowrider was a 1993 Saturn four-door. I said, I want to be the first one when you know, just really deep into low riding, is gonna have a Euro Saturn hopped up, juiced up, you know, on wire wheels. So my mom and dad came here from Colombia. My mom was a teacher. My dad was in the military. So she was able to come over with a visa and he had to cross the border illegally. And they already had my uh, older brother and two sisters. My mom came here with 72 bucks in her pocket and had to work to um, get enough money together to be able to pay a coyote to bring them over. And they, they came across the border, I think she told me, in Arizona. Uh, when my father and my brothers and sisters got here, my, my dad got right to work as a gardener and my mom was a housekeeper. And then they had me, which is what I think is politically now known as an anchor baby. So if you had a, an American born child, you were able to apply for residency. And so here's a Colombian family that wanted to stay here in the, in the country and, and have a piece of the American dream. So have a kid. <laughs> so they had me in 1975 and they ended up becoming uh, both US citizens. That's my mom and dad getting here. When I was pretty young, um, my inner parents ended up, you know, divorcing and splitting up and my mom had to figure out how she was going to take care of me and my little brother at, at the time. She went back to school and then started doing mortgage loans. And what was tough about that is that she was working her butt off. I don't know what time she would leave in the morning, but I know she would come back, pick me up probably around 7.30, take me to school. And then my aunt would pick me up from school and I would stay and I would uh, stay with her and she wouldn't pick me up until like 10 o'clock at night and she'd do that every, every day while she was, uh, you know, trying to put food on the table and be successful. So I wasn't uh, watched a whole lot. So as I, as I grew up, I became a, a little rebellious and, uh, and maybe hung around the, the wrong people during, during some of that time. The guys that I hung around, they didn't really care about the future, right? They didn't, they didn't uh, I had to figure that out too, but they didn't care about what was happening next. It was kind of like smile now, cry later type of focus, I guess, but it wasn't uncommon to uh, take things that wasn't yours, you know, do the wrong thing. It was like I was uh, in a little bit of a double life, I don't know. Um, I had the friends that I probably shouldn't have been hanging out with that were the wrong influence on me, but I had no real oversight, mostly because my mom was working so hard. And then I had the low riding guys that were different. And so I didn't spend a whole lot of time in school uh, to the point where they kicked me out and I didn't finish high school. My mom actually ended up kicking me out of the house and saying, you know what, you're too much. You're gonna go live with your dad because he lived far away. And so I, like any rebellious, young kid, fine, I know, I'll leave. I think the pivotal point for me during that time was uh, getting caught the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people and getting arrested, uh, and then getting my car taken away and going to jail, not, 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 not long. I didn't, I didn't go to the big house. Um, so it did show me the wrong path. I hadn't talked to my mom for like two months at least, and she called me out of the blue and said, I have a proposition for you. I have a tough mom, by the way. Uh, I have a proposition for you. I can get you into the business I'm in, and you can, you can join here, and I can, I can teach you. And I said, no thanks. I don't, I don't want to work with you. I don't want anything to do with you or your business. But my, uh, my girlfriend, Valerie, said, no, you should, you should give it a shot. You should try. Initially, I, I didn't even pay attention. I was, I was, I was kind of trying to figure out how to not be angry, but get a job and start something, right? Get a, get a career going. Within that year, I, I started to see what she was doing. She had placed herself in, in East LA doing mortgage loans for Hispanic families that she felt 
would benefit from helping them get into a house. She knew that home ownership did something for our family and, and help her become successful. Owning a home and having that equity in a home allowed her to achieve that. I didn't even realize it, that she was helping so many people achieve generational wealth in the Latino community, starting out in East LA, by just helping them get into their first home. And when I felt that for the first time, it was a, it was, it was where, where like it snapped, and it, and and I said, wow, I can't, I can't believe we're doing this. And she had kind of like let me just sort of figure it out and kind of run along. And then, I, and then finally she, she told me, you see, this is what we're doing. We're helping our people build wealth. We're going to help our people uh, achieve more. And that's what you're going to do. Now your, your path is going to be to help more Latino families help in building that wealth by helping them get into homes. What we're doing for them, they're not even going to realize it right now. They're going to realize it in 10, 15, 20 years when they see all this equity in their home and they are able to start businesses, send their kids to school, upgrade their house, make investments, whatever they're going to do, we're going to be part of that. And she wanted to make sure that I was part of that once I realized what we were doing. What do you think is the American dream? Um, wow, that's a great question. I, th I think the uh, American dream is happiness with yourself, family, and leaving some sort of legacy or generational wealth to your future. I think the American dream is people coming to this country and doing more than they could have ever done in their country of origin, and then, more so, leaving something for those that are coming after them, for their kids and their kids' kids. That's what I think the American dream is. As I just got more passionate about uh, what we were doing and what my mom and I were doing in, in home ownership, um, I found this organization called NARA, the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. That was back in 2002. I felt more empowered to be able to push harder, um, do more, get bigger, help more families, not just in my little community, but outside my community. In 2007, my wife and I had partnered with a gentleman that I met through that organization, organization Felix de Herrera, and we started our own company in Las Vegas, Nevada. Right as we did that, the entire economy crashed. It was the Great Recession, and Vegas was ground zero, and for the crash of the mortgage industry and housing. Yeah, we went from not being able to finance a, a copier to save our lives, to today we have about 60 branches in 40 states with 500 employees, and now we have about three to four brands that we work under, all of them helping people with home ownership. I think, I think my girls may have felt like I felt with my mom when I was little because they would, they would get picked up from school and brought with their backpacks, blankets, everything to the office because we would work till 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night every day and so they would, we would get a little section in the office uh, where they could lay down their blanket and, and go to sleep until we woke them up when it was time to leave and, and get them home. So yeah, um, a lot of hard work, a lot of grinding, and I, and I definitely learned that from, from my mom's hard work. I think at the end of the day, you, you have to follow your passion, and, and sometimes it's hard to find those things. I think there's definitely a path for everyone that gets very passionate and, I mean, to the point of being obsessed at something like we were and like we are. And if you are passionate, obsessed about something and you just keep at it and nothing can stop you, nothing can take you down because there's definitely more forces that will try to take you down than try to lift you up. And so if you can follow a passion like what I found, like me and my wife found, not only can you be fulfilled in life, but you can be pretty successful at it too and, and buy lowriders, you know? Now we're gonna work on our second lowrider, so. Follow your passion no matter what, and don't let anybody stop you. My name is Jason Madiedo. I'm CEO of Panorama Mortgage Group, and I am a lowrider role model.